I'm Stanley Sandler, the Command Historian for the Army Special Warfare Center and School of Fort Bragg. Uh, today we're interviewing uh, Chris Lambertson, uh, an OSS veteran, also uh, prominent in the development, development of the Lambertson Lung and uh, the establishment of Navy SEALs. So um, if you just introduce yourself again, sir, yes. some background. And my, my name is Dr. Chris, uh, La Christian J. Lambertson. I'm a professor of environmental medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, have, uh, if you like, I can uh, uh, go on with... Yeah, tell us how you uh, got started with the OSS, <coughs> whether Fine. they approached you or you them. Fine, and yes. Take All right, there. now <coughs> I have to say it and we'll go ahead. Uh, actually, I began the uh, uh, contact with OSS while I was a student in the School of Medicine in my first year, uh, at which time I had learned enough uh, physiology from the courses there to uh, see how to design apparatus that would allow individuals to work for long periods of time underwater without uh, uh, showing bubbles. And this was by means of oxygen rebreathing with absorption of the carbon dioxide that we produce. Uh, it was done in order to build a life-saving unit for use by lifeguards. But uh, it worked so well as the first of what you would now call scuba. It was the first. At what time is this now? This would have been 1939, mm -hmm. uh, spreading into 1940. And, uh, You're working independently then of, of Cousteau in, in uh, France? Cousteau uh, was about four, uh, four or so years later in uh, German-occupied France mm -hmm. so that we uh, had no uh, uh, connection at all. Right. And uh, the approach was military on the one hand, um, eventually on my part, and sport and photography on the other hand, the open circuit equipment. Was, didn't lend itself to military operations. So Cousteau is working from a civilian sporting exactly point of view. Exactly right, and did a good job, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so the thread I'm, I have is entirely uh, then after that first uh, effort to work towards life saving, to uh, uh, to see that there was a war generating at that point in time, about mm -hmm. 1940. It was a bit before Pearl Harbor, and uh, at that time I took the. Uh, this new uh, kind of equipment, uh, which, as I say, had to be the first uh, scuba in the United States. Mm -hmm. There were no scuba divers, none of them, anybody. And the, Everybody uh, still used those things with the helmets and uh, uh, yes, the diving. Yes, uh, uh, deep sea diving, of course, was important, so I went to the salvage section of the Navy in order to try to bring out the probable usefulness of, of stealth in naval uh, operations. And because the salvage section wasn't geared towards that kind of yeah. thinking, it, it was not interested and indicated that that was not a, a uh, desirable approach from the standpoint of the, of the U.S. Navy to uh, generate groups of men to work under sea and attack formation. But weren't they aware of the work the Italians did? Uh... Uh, they were not, but clearly they were not, and the Italians were just barely getting started at that this point. This is a bit early. I think probably we were, we were unknowingly starting at about the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, what, uh, what then happened, of course, was when Pearl Harbor occurred and OSS was formed, uh, someone in the Navy uh, got the uh, uh, got the wind of this and passed the information on to uh, General Donovan's office, and I got communication from there to come and demonstrate, and did so. And now in the Navy experimental diving unit, where they had a water filled compartment that could be pressurized, mm -hmm. and that's the connection then with o with OSS. It came uh, through a missed attempt to get it into standard military operation, uh, which then unfortunately persisted throughout the whole of World War II because when OSS picked it up, the Navy did not uh, do more than uh, generate these very effective surface swimmers called the underwater demolition teams. And you remember the UDTs mm -hmm. were surface swimmers with face masks uh, and the frog men. fins. Their frogmen uh, generated after Tarawa, uh, where they had hang-ups in the landing, mm -hmm. you recall, lost tremendous numbers of men. Then the Navy pushed for uh, the generation of large and very effective beach reconnaissance groups. OSS's path 
was a different one. That was to operate by stealth without anyone knowing that individuals were there, to work by night uh, with no sign of the individuals, to be able to communicate together underwater. But wasn't the Navy interested in... Uh They'd have to go in stealthily before a land, uh, let's say. They and didn't do that. They uh, they uh, they had to. Uh, they uh, they were used entirely for uh, uh, for beach uh, reconnaissance, meaning uh, prior to amphibious landings, mm -hmm. and for obstacle clearance prior to amphibious landings. And so the technique eventually became one of working under the bombardment of the shore. They uh, wouldn't would, go in ahead of time and uh, uh, remove obstacles? Very rare, uh, very, but no, because it would have given away the, uh, the, uh, the landing plan. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a very uh, large difference in approach and mm -hmm. very effective for the Navy because we were moving by that time. This was several years later. During all of that early period of time, it was necessary to train the, devise the, uh, the military models of this equipment. Uh, away from the life-saving, lightweight and not very long-lasting, to tough equipment that would sustain people well and last for several years. And uh, men were recruited mostly from Southern California, uh, the so-called water rats, the beach uh, uh, surfers of uh, Southern mm -hmm. California. Men, Even then they had them, huh? Oh, they did, yes indeed. Their grandfathers were surfers, I think. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, uh, these people were uh, quite young, perhaps in their early 20s or so, uh, and younger, and uh, were enlisted in Coast Guard, Marines, Army, Navy. So OSS recruited these people in all of these different services into the equivalent of uh, small companies, about three of them. And what did OSS have in mind for this? What's their... uh, uh, OSS uh, uh, really had in mind what I was trying to get across to the Navy because that's how it got into OSS. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what it had in mind was the planned attacks upon harbors, reconnaissance on harbors, attacks upon shipping in harbors, uh, operations by stealth for any purpose at all, whether it was for, uh, for entry into a country as opposed to parachuting, uh, or otherwise, and and uh, these were uh, a maritime unit was formed, which encompassed this activity and several others uh, uh, as well. If I can ask another foreign yeah. question now, the British are getting active by this time. Uh, this, uh, later, they had the raid on Singapore, yeah, the Turkets. Were you any connection? To there was a very nice connection there yeah. through OSS because OSS passed the word over to uh, uh, to the English. The English were losing men in, the, uh, in their training activity using equipment that wasn't uh, uh, really good enough, uh, but they were also unaware of the physiological aspects of this, and they would be losing men, divers, mm -hmm. in training, who went out in their training operations and were killed in training by accident, by suffocation, in fact. And uh, therefore, what happened was that the British officers came over to Philadelphia uh, while I was a medical student and we would meet in the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. Uh, for very uh, uh, private, secret meetings. And you're um, just a medical student at this time. And I was a medical student, oh. and we, uh, we, I had no offices, no anything. So we, uh, just for fun now, we used the maternity waiting room <laughs> as the meeting place for OSS uh, British uh, This is all top secret stuff, I at suppose. At that time, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So there's just a bit of humor there that will uh, give you an idea of how, how basic things were at yeah. that point in time. But it was easy to show them by demonstrating, by taking individuals and making them go unconscious uh, with the kinds of things they were doing by accident. Where so would your we facilities be located? At Penn or the Navy Yard? Uh, or the, the facilities were simply myself and a physiology laboratory, teaching laboratory, with some odds and ends of uh, tubing and other such things to put uh, equipment together with. And then, uh, then a uh, uh, it became possible to link up with a company uh, for non-commercial reasons, uh, the Ohio Chemical and Manufacturing Company in uh, Cleveland. And that company subsidized about a three months effort to improve upon what was done in the physiology laboratory. Uh, that then was the apparatus that was used to demonstrate to OSS 
what the capability was. It took about three months to put a mm -hmm. prototype together. You couldn't get equipment from the Navy Yard there? They just didn't it, have it? It, it, uh, it, it, the Navy Yard took care of ships. It wasn't a developmental system mm -hmm. at that point in time. It right. went on to become a good Navy aviation development place. So I think the next, uh, the next element was that the uh, several people in OSS became assigned to active recruitment. I could not do that active recruitment. It was a developmental function. But I, uh, and then several, uh, as I say, a couple of years went by, and I joined OSS fully. Uh, when that would that probably have been? about the end of '43. Uh, then, mm -hmm. and uh, at that point in time, was given the immediate task of within a day of of going out and getting the apparatus into the underwater breathing apparatus into uh, production. And this took uh, probably about a maximum of a month to go from prototype to uh, actual production of the equipment that took us through a war and 15 That's years later. That's fast. It was fast. It was but there was a war on, so. There was a war yeah. on. They held up airplanes. Mm. Uh, they, uh, uh, I know that individuals would stand in the doorway of an airplane to wait for delivery of something so the plane couldn't take off. All kinds was of Was it uh, Donovan, do you think, that pushed, that got this priority? Or, uh, I think uh, I think probably yes, uh, but the, there also was a, po a positive policy of let's do something Thing, as opposed to uh, looking for reasons for not doing something. Uh, just you know, comparing that with the Navy screw up on on the torpedoes, you know yeah. how long mm -hmm. that took to finally yeah. get on the ball. This is incredible. Well, what fast. I'm really saying is that this this happened. I was simply told go ahead and do it, and, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore uh, having the uh, the means and the energy was uh, it was uh, fairly uh, straight. Did now, you ever meet Donovan? Uh, oh yes, indeed. Can you tell uh, us both something here about and in, the, uh, in Burma? Yes, both in this country and in Burma, sure. Now, what uh, I think I'd better get on a sure. track from here, because that merely says something started from somewhere, and what's the difference? OSS wanted things to happen. The Navy at that point in time had uh, not quite had a Pearl Harbor, and when Pearl Harbor hit it, then it was in a situation where it couldn't do many things. It had to recreate a, a positive power and it had to put its priorities there. It wouldn't be for Pearl Harbor, it couldn't after. And it couldn't after, after yeah. but my aim was to have, uh, to have the, that period of time made maximal use of by small groups, as opposed to waiting until the fleet built up again. You mm -hmm. see, that was just the time we needed and we lost all that time. I'm telling you that because uh, then when we finally did get the equipment produced, and we did get the groups trained, and we did this in the Caribbean off of Nassau, rented an island, and had that island secure, so even the British uh, Air Force could not fly over it. They were not allowed to fly over it. Uh, that was the training base for the MU, I named them Operational Swimmers, not UDTs. But what was the name of the island, do you remember? Uh, well, as usual, it was called Treasure Island. <laughs> Uh, but I don't know its real name, oh. but that was the local name yeah. for it. Yeah. And it was about uh, two miles long and about perhaps a uh, third of a mile wide and simply had an old uh, derelict house on it as a, as a base and, uh, and, and good uh, water uh, nearby. Mm -hmm. So now what happened to the groups? Uh, still trying to get them into the Navy, we took the first of the trained groups uh, and, and sent them to the Pacific with full equipment, which by that uh, uh, that time was available, you see. That's when we could begin the training, when we had to do So what equipment. time frame is this? And this would have been, uh, uh, it would have been early 40, early 44, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really a loss, because these men were uh, simply integrated into the then surface swimming UDTs. The equipment was put aside. Their night training was put aside mm -hmm. and never used. Yeah. So that even though we had that second chance to introduce true operations by stealth, the times had passed. And now the march up the, uh, the Pacific this Islands is after had begun. Tower, and, yeah. Just, yeah. and therefore you can understand why. But there was another reason, and that uh, one of these reasons was that uh, I think you probably know more than I, Doc, uh, 
uh, General MacArthur did not want OSS people in his command. Mm -hmm. Therefore, to have OSS injecting a uh, group of trained operators into the Navy was something that was resisted, and uh, mm -hmm. and we therefore had we lost an outlet for OSS trained operators because. Of, uh, the, uh, uh, the war in England had moved to the point by this time where it, in fact, was not in need of this kind of activity uh, by stealth, but rather the build-up for the big uh, landings, yeah, yeah. and therefore we lost that. During all of this time, the Italians were doing a beautiful job in their backyard. We always had thousands of miles to go before we had targets. They had perhaps a few yards to go because they used the diplomatic pathway through Spain, for example. And, and, and they bought them down two battleships. And they and, and they did, yeah. Yes, they did, and cru cruisers, you know, in Gibraltar mm -hmm. Harbor. So we really uh, had, I think, anticipated all of this, preceded the development, and lost the opportunities yeah. one after the other. And I'm telling you a different story from what some of the other people here will be telling you, because mm -hmm. they were sent in early, and had the opportunity. We tried to get in early, even OSS tried to get in early, and uh, because it was dependent upon target seeking, meaning opportunity for, for being useful, uh, we lost years mm. there. As Literally reason, years? I think so. I think probably in the middle of the we war. got well uh, from 1940 to whatever you call it, yeah. 1944. I think we lost three years yeah. from before uh, Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. because the demonstrated tactics capability was there and uh, the uh, unit was for, uh, formed. All of this recruitment mm -hmm. was done. It was a progressive development over all that period of time. At least you had that you were developing the technical uh, aspects. Yeah, so I think the emphasis here is not so much on what did uh, uh, Unit 101 or Detachment 101 do. We did go to, uh, I took the last group to uh, uh, the Burma Theater, in, uh, India Burma uh, mm -hmm. Theater, uh, based in Gaul to continue to keep the training up. Uh, introduced a second level of training, which was the one-man submersible that the uh, British colonel uh, developed, uh, the so-called Sleeping Beauty, which is, which is documented as, as equipment in uh, some of the OSS archives. And that was a, a wet submersible in which the, the cockpit flooded and the individual had to wear breathing apparatus. And by combining that submersible with the, with the so-called LaRue, which was the breathing apparatus that I had designed, we made a rider and a horse so that one could work in regions where the swimmer could not by himself. And if he wouldn't have the strength to carry the long distance. He wouldn't have the endurance or the strength. And I think what you want to try to picture now is a thread from this developmental activity that almost made it well accepting not for any guilt on the part of a salvage section, for example, because it wasn't really, mm -hmm. it shouldn't have been a decision by the a salvage section, it just wasn't passed on well, let's say. Uh, up to the present time has been a continuous flow from that point in time, right on through into the Army for river work and into the Navy for, uh, to make the UDTs go underwater and work from submarines instead of being surface swimmers. And we are developing and right out of now. that came the uh, further development of work from small submersibles landing on submarines uh, that the SEAL teams now have. So I think what we have is from 1939 on a very beautiful continuous thread of development with big holes in it over the years. Uh, simply because there were lag times of development that mm -hmm. worked in. I want to ask you now the the divide the, the uh, Sleeping Beauty. Yeah. Was that what the British used at Singapore? Uh, oh, I think they used kayaks, uh, as far mm -hmm. as I recall. Now, I, I would like you not to just accept this okay. because I'm merely repeating things that I have uh, mm -hmm. read. But uh, they had the kayak uh, as a technique. Uh, and uh, and use that uh, twice, I think, once successfully and once yeah. not. Yeah, well, the, the attack on the Singapore, though, they had, well, this is one-man one submarines. That's not in your line of work particularly? Uh, <coughs> if they did, uh, that I didn't realize. Mm -hmm. uh, see, that would be in my line of work. That, uh, but we were we were detached in information and all of yeah. that. So I think you probably know more than I do about what actually happened. 
There, I don't. It wasn't a wet. I think it was a, a dry one-man uh, submersible they used. Uh, Something like the Japanese used unsuccessfully. Well, I think you better you better check well on that yeah. because I didn't think they had a dry one at mm -hmm. that point in time. But, uh, yeah. I don't believe they had one, but you just you'll have to check on that. Well, let let me see if I can now back up uh, back up again to the uh, to the Burma situation because there. The OG groups and the uh, MU groups joined forces uh, on the Arakan campaign, mm -hmm. and the groups that uh, that I had trained and I joined with them. Then the training was finished. The training of the groups was finished, and the, and the last group went on over to Gaul, as I said. Uh, in in uh, on the Arakan campaign, there was only one landing. And that was uh, uh, on Ramry Island, and the the uh, group that I had participated in that landing, but they were not there as primary beach reconnaissance people. They merely became part of the force mm -hmm. because that's the way it was. And so I would say we can't uh, operationally say that aside from some related other reconnaissance done in that operation, ever did the kind of thing that we had conceived in the first place yeah. of surreptitious night attacks, meaning not just reconnaissance, but destructive attacks upon targets, mm -hmm. which was what we primarily planned for. But now, technically then, if we take that thread and say OSS now uh, brought its, uh, this crew back after uh, the Burma campaign had begun to taper off, it was on shipboard on the way back when uh, uh, the atomic bomb was dropped, and uh, at that point in time, uh, Truman disbanded OSS just a, within months, I think, of that. Yeah. And we, uh, arriving back on shipboard, took a month or two to get back. And ar on arrival back, all of the swimmers I had trained were discharged instantly like that. They had no other skills, and the uh, country was after demobilization, and therefore I was the last and only remaining person. Because I was a medical officer, as well as a, an operational uh, uh, type uh, uh, making the system happen, I had to carry both roles because my commission was a medical commission, you see. Mm -hmm. I didn't serve excepting uh, on the side as a medical officer with the groups I was with. Yeah. Uh, there would be no other. There was no choice. And you didn't have a chance to practice your medicine in, in uh, 101? Uh, I, I took care of everybody. I took care of everybody, wherever I was. But that was not what I was assigned to do. Mm -hmm. That was just an ancillary activity because it was needed, you see. And with uh, Colonel Petticord's OG group on on uh, Ramry Island, for example, I took care of everyone from civilians on through the OGs and, and the MUs. Like took care okay, you mean know, the medical? Uh, yeah, 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 because it, it was needed. Uh -huh. with, uh, we were with British troops and, the, uh, and, uh, and that was a normal thing to do. But the goal was to, uh, uh, to improve the operational capability. That was a real assignment. And now came the end of uh, OSS and coming back, finding documentation being to the headquarters, finding documentation being uh, destroyed, which, uh, and uh, one, perhaps one man in the uh, headquarters still. Uh, uh, what I did was to uh, uh, get an OSS truck, and as an individual now, uh, Army Captain Medical Officer, go to OSS warehouses, and load the truck with all of the OSS underwater equipment that mm -hmm. I could get my hands on uh, without any permission. Of course, there's nobody to give permission, uh, but I still owe that equipment to the government. All so, right. All right. So you, you, mustn't, you mustn't tell them about mm -hmm. that. Cut off the camera. Um, <laughs> and, and I took that personally to Coast Guard headquarters, to Navy, again, salvage section, and to Army engineer headquarters and left the equipment and manuals and, uh, and discussions with the right kind of people in each one of those three places. And within probably a couple of months, the Coast Guard Commandant requested that I set up a training course for air-sea rescue. Now we have a thread of what happens after 
right after war. World War II, months after World War II, let's say. And whereas none of this was known to any of these people during the war because it hadn't entered into the military, mm -hmm. uh, suddenly they did know. And uh, Coast Guard, I did set up the training program, trained a cadre. And where are you now? At, at, at the Port. I, I was uh, at the tail end of the Army. Uh, I, had, I was not discharged because I was a medical officer. Yeah. And post-war medical officers are not discharged. They're kept. There's a lot of problems. There are, there are many problems, medical problems, yeah. people to take care now, of. Where are you so stationed, though, at this time? At Atlantic City General Hospital. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was transferred then from OSS to a general hospital. Well, at least you're near the water, man. Yeah, right. And as that, uh, while there, uh, took leave to go and and train the Coast Guard cadre as instructors in self-contained diving. So the Coast Guard had the first official yeah. self-contained diving units in the, in the government. What would be the Coast Guard's interest in this? Uh, air Sea Rescue, uh, because when a plane is down, sometimes it's possible to go down and recover the, the pilot or recover the plane, uh, and they wanted, the, uh, they wanted divers, self-contained divers on the, on the crash boats. You see, these are uh, where where there are air ba uh, coast guard bases. They're on the water, mm -hmm. and they have crash boats that immediately, and if there's an accident nearby, go out to the to the site of that accident, a landing or other accident, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what they had. It was simply imagination. Let's mm -hmm. say they were that quick, and said that sounds tremendous. So. The Army sent a Army engineers responded by sending an observer and a uh, who happened to be a, a colonel uh, and uh, and as a result of his observing the Coast Guard course, the Army engineers set up a trial for the next uh, some months later, uh, meaning a several month uh, 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 investigation of how to adapt self-contained diving to Army engineer attack and other activities. So what do they rivers. have in mind now? They had river work in mind, surreptitious mm -hmm. crossings, surreptitious downstream. Mm -hmm. We planned and carried out 10-mile downstream attacks, for example, uh, we, because when the river is flowing, you have no problem going mm -hmm. downstream. You have trouble getting back again, but mm -hmm. that's another matter. Mm -hmm. Uh, attacks upon bridges, for example, the surreptitious attacks. And putting explosives around uh, it. Yes, uh, putting, running communication lines underwater from one side of a river to another, even if the mm -hmm. river is a couple of miles wide, you see. Although all this sounds like the sort of thing the OSS it's a, could have been doing. Well, uh, it is standing. indeed, you see, and these were all things that had been preconceived, but now suddenly I had a chance to get them into Hungary, uh, we had a new generation of uh, officers in these organizations, do you see? Mm -hmm. Now there are people who come through a war yeah. as opposed to some who didn't see a war coming. It's, it's the normal situation. Yeah. It's not, nobody's to blame, do you mm -hmm. see? But it truly, the first effort pre-OSS failed because people weren't looking ahead. After the war, it succeeded very fast because people just got through with the war yeah. and they all were uh, still living what they had experienced themselves. So when they saw some, imagination, they saw imagination, they, they, they wanted to use it. Mm -hmm. And then by, by word of mouth, the Navy amphibious forces on the Atlantic uh, fleet, in, of the Atlantic fleet, uh, the admiral in charge got word of this Army engineer activity, which was very intensive. Uh, everywhere from a demolition on through a, subver a subversion, uh, let's say. Uh, and uh, I then was asked, and uh, by this time I was uh, out of the Army into uh, the University of Pennsylvania as a research uh, and a teacher and a research uh, uh, worker. Uh, I took leave from there to, uh, to train the first UDT operatives, underwater demolition team swimmers mm -hmm. and their officers on the Atlantic coast. This was... Uh, now, using your equipment uh, now. You use, that's all there was. Yeah. There was no other. See, there is a, there Did you get any feedback by this time from the, from the Italians, let's say, anything they did that you Absolutely. could use or the French? By that time, of course, I then, we had then, we, all of us who were involved, did know of what the Italians had done. But it, uh, during the time we were working, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. All through the war, I had no idea 
What was there any post-war stuff that you picked up from the attendants? Oh yes, and we actually uh, hired uh, the Navy hired a one of the Italian operatives who was oh. senior, relatively senior in uh, in experience, mm -hmm. and made him a part of this uh, of this effort as a consultant. Mm -hmm. So we did begin to act in a very normal fashion. How about the Japanese? Did you have anything to learn from them? Uh, not directly, only by by general word from the newspapers of peculiar kinds of underwater suicide mm -hmm. attempts that they. Uh, had designs such as uh, divers on the bottom of the harbor uh, coming up against uh, ships as they came in, an impractical kind and that of That would appeal to you anyway, suicide. Yeah. Uh, no, was... and it was not practical. So what, what came out of this very uh, uh, first effort with the Navy amphibious forces was a couple of weeks of intensive training which took the UDTs and converted them from surface swimmers to skillful uh, underwater mm -hmm. operators, yeah. not with all the tactics, but with the ability to use the equipment. And we added then, uh, in another, in another opera, this was about 1947, uh, then. by this, this time we'd hit 1947, mm -hmm. by the time we got to the Navy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this allowed us to bring in the Sleeping Beauty and uh, demonstrate the combination of Diver and Sleeping Beauty uh, I wrote to Did you the, actually bring a Sleeping Beauty over from England? Uh, uh, the Navy procured these things from OSS, uh, do you see? Mm -hmm. They found, not from OSS as an organization, but it began to track down where is the rest of all this equipment that I hadn't pilfered, you see, uh, in trying to distribute. Well, at least they didn't track you down. They did, they, they, and they did, and that they did not know of that, except in through this Army course. Uh, so now I think I'm trying to keep a, a thread and the final knot is that by getting the Sleeping Beauty, since I was the teacher of that technique in Gaul, Ceylon, for potential operations in Burma, I became the teacher of the U.S. Navy underwater demolition teams in uh, uh, one-man submarine operations as a civilian uh, assistant professor of pharmacology, you mm -hmm. see, mm -hmm. and the, and the uh, uh, again the Navy leaders on the Atlantic coast were so sharp from the past war that the head of the submarine service Atlantic offered a submarine to allow us to uh, me to demonstrate lockout of, of swimmers from the submarines underway. And we did that. I did that. With what was his name and some of the other leaders as well? Uh, yes, I, I do remember these two people extremely well, and I have uh, all of this documented okay. in correspondence and so forth. Uh, Admiral Davis was the head of the amphibious force. I don't have his first name, but I have it in writing. Uh, and Admiral Fife was the head of the submarine force in the Atlantic. And these were two very positive people. Uh, they liked the thought that something was happening with their uh, their forces, mm -hmm. and so Admiral Fife actually came along on on one of these operations. Then. And what it meant is that by demonstrating that a that in, an individual could land on an underway submersible, and having secured the small one, theoretically enter the submarine, and then if uh, or leave the submersible, uh, leave the large submarine underwater underway, and and take off and come back and join it. By doing that demonstration, of which I have photographs, mm -hmm. you see, uh, it opened the eyes of uh, of some of the people in the CNO's office, chief of naval operations office that there were methods that could be used. Well, would this still be the sleeping or modified that sleeping? It beauty was the sleeping beauty yeah. exactly yeah. that. There was no naval equipment. That started a go-round of technical interchange, mm -hmm. which uh, now, by joining the National Academy of Sciences and the Navy and universities and industry together, we were able to get a flow of communication going in the country. Mm -hmm. That then, I think, was the thread that helped bring new ideas in and, and commerce in and other such things that made the evolution of the uh, present very advanced SEAL team techniques uh, occur. The operations depend still upon takeoff from submersion, uh, uh, 
return, pick up and return, mm -hmm. return and pick up that were demonstrated. And one of the things that made it uh, clear that this was possible was that we took pictures of the landing and take off. And to do that, we had to take brand new divers and lash them to the conning tower of the submers uh, submarine mm -hmm. uh, with a couple of waterproofed cameras with 50 feet of film in each. Were these guys volunteers? They had to be volunteers, yeah. You know, and they were mature individuals, too. So they lashed them to the conning tower and submerged. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. you know. Scary and the, experience. And that's it. You know, and they got the pictures, too. And they had some wetsuits on? Then. No wetsuits. They had just ordinary uh, whatever. Uh, I don't even recall that, but there were no wetsuits in those days, you mm -hmm. see. They, uh, what we tended to wear was just long johns, uh, OD long johns. And the, there was nothing else. But what was their breathing apparatus? They were using my, my uh, uh, oxygen breathing mm -hmm. apparatus, so they were on the verge of oxygen poisoning. All of that period of time, so was I, in doing the landing, you see. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that meant that it was touch and go all the way along the line, but people were willing to do that. Mm -hmm. No communications between the inside and the outside of the submarine, mm -hmm. excepting a hammer which you hit the conning tower with when you wanted to come up. <laughs> and that was it. And uh, So you see now there's beautiful, tremendous uh, capability in the Navy and the Army. And the uh, Coast Guard has more or less put the, the concept aside, but the Army Special Forces, I think, have a thread going back to this uh, uh, effort in the out of Fort Knox, where we did the demonstrations of the many different things that could be uh, done there. And the thread for Navy comes through that uh, uh, that first training of the Why Navy. Fort Knox? Uh Where's there the was what there? is called, uh, well, the Ohio River is, uh, uh, is there, mm -hmm. uh, but what was there was the headquarters of what was called the Army Research and Development Laboratories. This was considered a Army Engineering Research and Development mm -hmm. Lab. This was an engineering research and development uh, research pro project uh, to demonstrate uh, the capability of new operations mm -hmm. then. Now, I think what I'd like to do is is uh, try to picture what else has come out of this thread. Because if I take you right back to the beginning, uh, what this all dealt with was people breathing oxygen uh, in a closed system with nothing coming out and nothing but the oxygen coming in. So that no meant, telltale bubbles then? No bubbles and you could, it would last for many, many hours as compared to minutes. Where, uh, with the sort of thing that the French designed, where you take a breath and blow it away, mm -hmm. and another breath and blow it away. Here you rebreathe and absorb your uh, metabolite carbon dioxide. That thread of oxygen carried us, uh, carried us over the years in the Navy, and uh, not so much in the Army, but in the Air Force, and then eventually in NASA, to each of these peculiar atmospheres that we are exposed to. The same, uh, same thread of information, uh, not equipment now so much as the human physiological responses, uh, led to the ability for man to work in space in a pure oxygen environment at first, which is what was used in the Mercury Gemini programs, mm -hmm. still is used, landing on the moon was pure oxygen. Uh, work in space, EV, uh, extravehicular activities, pure oxygen. Is the key to this the way that you purified the uh, car, the, the waste? It's a heavy, a heavy part of it, but the other key is what is the tolerance of the human body tissues, mm -hmm. the lung, the brain, the uh, uh, visual system, things of that sort. So there's a, a very large physiological, environmental, medical thread in the aerospace field. The same thread goes on through the special warfare uh, field in the divers in the army, breathing pure oxygen, mm -hmm. in the SEAL teams, breathing mixtures or pure oxygen. Uh, whether they're in small submarines or not, it's still the same problem that we had years and years ago. And the, uh, the investment in that uh, has kept this whole s connection alive over the years. The, the thread's unbroken through that physiological... You're fortunate thing. because in the post-war years, so many threads were snapped and they budgetary were, yeah. cuts and... Yeah, 
And, and what was done here that really helped is that a lot of naval officers, medical officers, were sent up to the institute where the, we had a headquarters for this kind of work in the country, a non-government headquarters called an Institute for Environmental Medicine. Maybe one, this would be time to go into now the founding of this, yeah. your work in, in founding that at Penn. Yeah, I think it was truly founded right out of the OSS thread that I told you about. And when would because that Because having that was, that uh, the beginnings of it were approximately in the neighborhood of about 1950, but officially it wasn't dedicated by the university until about 1968, mm -hmm. uh, at which time it was completely rebuilt at a large cost. But I, I, I think what I'm trying now to uh, recapture is that that thread continues because if you picture what we're dealing with, we're dealing with the life substance. The primary life substance is oxygen. It made, knowing how to use that made it possible to develop underwater operations and aerospace operations and new forms of therapy. And now we have that same substance uh, becoming one of the critical components of the overall environment, which spreads out and touches the rainforests and their oh. generation of oxygen. The ozone layer, which is oxygen, which has been caused to be charged, and all of the harmful aspects of that. And so I think we have, a, if you have the, uh, the picture of threads here, you can almost see that just being interested in oxygen has opened up, uh, it mm -hmm. opened itself up into an environmental era, not just a military era, but an environmental era. So I think that thread touches civilian life yeah, uh, as well. Then. And what I'm trying to do is give OSS credit for imagination when it wasn't there in the country. And it did have it, even though it didn't have the chance to make the most effective use of it. The technical development that it carried out transferred intact then. Right from Ramen Island. From there, right on, right on up to the present, and the relationships are now still very, very good. In other words, with the uh, Navy, uh, not so actively with the Army, but they're there, and heavily with Air Force and heavily with NASA. So I think that uh, you have almost a, a tree that uh, spawned out of the OSS uh, uh, beginning of this sort of thing. How about the Lambertson lung? Uh, can you go into the development of that? Uh, I can. I, I think uh, maybe uh, just to restate the, the simplicity of the concept, which uh, was that if you took a chemical uh, which would absorb a solid chemical, uh, which you call sodalime, it was an alkali, uh, which would, if you breathe through it, remove the carbon dioxide from the breath, from the exhaled breath. A technique used in anesthesia apparatus, not brand new to, uh, to me, certainly. Uh, and if you uh, made that big enough to handle not the unconscious patient who produces very little carbon dioxide, but the hard-working underwater operator who produces mm -hmm. what a runner does almost, you see, uh, that meant much more efficient design of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide absorption systems. That's the key to the development of any self-contained, truly self-contained underwater breather, uh, breathing apparatus, mm -hmm. uh, uh, meaning rebreathing apparatus. Uh, so the OSS roots are there as well? Yeah, and they're there. And now the, uh, uh, the rest of it is, is uh, breathing out and saving the exhaled air, uh, exhaled oxygen or gas mixture, depending upon what it is that you have in the cylinder, and having that available uh, after it's purified of CO2 to re-inhale without putting bubbles out. Mm -hmm. And there have been advances uh, of well, that. That's the origin, the conceptual origin. The real key to it, though, was something that hadn't been done before, and that's to make something neutrally buoyant so that you didn't have to walk on the bottom heavily weighed down, mm -hmm. stuck in the mud, uh, and doing the heavy work of deep sea divers, which is still necessary. Uh, but rather, you became like, the, uh, like a flyer in the water, able to 
choose depth as at will, turn and, and invert and, and almost fly like a uh, like a bird or a plane does. Uh, swim fins had been invented, so by putting the swim fins and the underwater breathing apparatus together and getting away from the lead and the walking, it became possible to cover large distances, several miles, as opposed to having trouble getting getting through. Uh, the other other features of the design included designing communication apparatus because we insisted on a full face mask so you uh, could talk. And by designing a, speak, a mechanical speaking device, it was possible for individuals to speak to each other. We could keep in touch with each other underwater. And after the war, when uh, the French equipment uh, was designed, and temporarily the Navy uh, switched to that, simply because the equipment that uh, the OSS had built was limited in amount, and this was some 15 years later, it had worn out in about 15 years, you yeah. see. It lasted about that long. Yeah. Uh, they began using what you now call aqualungs, just because they were easier to use, of no use for stealth. Yeah, they and, bottles, yeah. and also, they had a mouthpiece. And the mask was not put on, the speech was lost, the communication was lost, and people were just swimming about with noise-making, bubble-making, non-communicating equipment. So what we're trying to do now is get all of those old tricks back again into the present, uh, present uh, very expensive new design. This is what so you're working on now, I think. I'm not, yeah. but I'm trying to keep influencing. That's not my work. My work is what happens in people, not development of equipment, mm -hmm. you see. But still the connections are there and the, the communication is there now. But you see, we have to regain a lot of the things at once were taken for granted in uh, by OSS. Well, do you serve as a consultant for any of the, uh, this development? Only voluntary. Uh, yeah, let's just say it's it's a normal, ordinary uh, communication based upon the fact that uh, people have been around a long time, and we don't need consultantships or things. And they like just that. give you a phone call or that's talk the to idea, you. and mm -hmm. uh, and visits that uh, that happens. The threads mm -hmm. are very good. No, that's good. Uh, that's still being maintained. Yeah, yeah. That, that's so. And the laboratory is still, uh, I think, the main civilian headquarters for uh, generating the new information on people under this kind of stress. And therefore, it connects with the equipment development. But now there are some very, very fine teams of engineers doing the development. They don't really need much help, I think. Mm -hmm. right. So I, I think that's the, uh, that's the story that says that we did not have a vigorous operational fighting attack campaign. What we did have as OSS was a chance to convert our other military services to attack from just reconnaissance. I think that's, uh, if you understand, uh, the reconnaissance underwater demolition teams surface swimmers could learn something about what was uh, present. But uh, it takes more than that to uh, unannounced and unknown reach into places anywhere in the world and make things happen because you are in charge. And, uh, and, and make them happen stealthily. And make them happen stealthily. Yeah. In other words, uh, there many of the uh, present SEAL team officers think of as do know of OSS. It's not in their history. Mm. You know, it's not there, but they, they know of it and uh, believe that OSS converted them from, uh, from surface swimmers to attack units, and that makes them feel, feel good. That's what they want to be. They didn't mm. want to be just. But they also were resisted, by the way. I think you may know that of special forces generally. Mm -hmm. There has right. been a resistance to, in the past years, to special forces. SEAL teams were resisted, just as uh, the OSS groups were resisted. And all along you see this attempt to take another step forward, being resisted out of unawareness. From I the think conventional it's services. Not, it's, not, uh, it's not informed resistance. Mm -hmm. I think it's uninformed resistance.
just as it was in the beginning. So that we have to fight over each of these humps. I think we're now in a, in a position where, where you can help maybe. Do our best.